I am delighted to be joined uh, by Janice Johnson today to, I'm smiling, but we're actually talking about a very sobering topic. So I need to put my um, heavy topic face on uh, to discuss the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Um, quite a dark um, place in our kind of faith's history. Um, Janice, could you kind of, I know this is, you probably get this question all the time as a starter, but for those who don't know, could you explain the Mountain Meadows Massacre and perhaps some of the historical context around it that would give it a bit more kind of understanding? Sure. Um, so in 1857, um, uh, Utah, the saints are, are in Utah. They have crossed the plains. They are in Utah. And, um, uh, you know, they've, they have crossed America, gone further and further west, trying to find a, a place where they were settled um, and, and could exist and practice their religion. Um, in 1857, James Buchanan is the U.S. president, and he declares Utah in rebellion, um, and things get very tense from there. Um, historians will later call this Buchanan's blunder. Um, uh, kind of universally, people think this was a, a bad move to call Utah in rebellion. Um, when the Civil War breaks out in the United States, the largest single contingent of um, soldiers is in Utah. So they're needed in the East to actually fight the Civil War, and they're in Utah doing nothing because there never was what what historians call the Utah war, but was never actually a war. But this is, is kind of the backdrop. Things are very tense. And leading up to the time when the federal army actually arrives in Utah, things are tense. Um, and in the fall of 1857, um, there is a, a wagon train actually made up of two extended group families from Northwest Arkansas, who are coming through Utah, like many other trains came through Utah in 1857. Because things were so tense, the majority of them went the northern route to California, which today, um, if anyone's familiar with um, highways, it would be it's a very long drive for anyone British, but it's a, um, following Highway 80, you can go to kind of to Northern California to San Francisco, or you can follow I-15, which cuts through Utah and goes to Southern California. Um, and this is the route that they chose. Um, so they're coming through Utah at a very tense point in time. Um, martial law hasn't been declared yet. There, there's more tension that will come. But by the time that they get to Southern Utah, um, they are, and, and Southern Utah in 1857 is very much separated. Um, this is over 300 miles. And in the 19th century, that takes days to traverse. Um, this is pre-telegraph. So we have a limited amount of information. Um, this the train has some kind of minor run-ins as they're, as they're moving south. Um, but once they hit Cedar City, which um, is kind of the biggest city in southern Utah at this time, um, the, the trail goes to the west. And you, there is this place called Mountain Meadows. It was literally a mountain meadow. And trains would tend to graze there, would usually stop for a, a period of time and would graze their cattle in preparation to crossing the, the desert. So Las Vegas is lies ahead and there is real, I mean, Utah is a desert itself, but it's real desert that gets um, even much more mm. hazardous um, that they need to prepare to cross. And so um, this group had um, had some run-ins as they were on their way south. Things were pretty tense in Cedar City. Um, there was the, the Saints, Brigham Young had ordered the Saints not to sell to immigrants because he was fearful. They had word that the federal army was coming and they felt like they needed to prepare themselves and take care of themselves. Um, this fam, these, this immigrant group wanted, needed 
supplies for the trip across the desert. And um, there were people in Cedar City who were willing to mill grain for them, but they were charging them exorbitant prices. Um, and things were really tense there. And, and there are a lot of rumors about what happened in the actually happened in Cedar City from people swearing to um, uh, perhaps violence against women or at least threats of violence against women. There's a pretty broad spectrum of the rumors and the rumors are really difficult to unpack, um, particularly 150 years after the event. Yeah. Um, but this train goes all the way to the Mount Meadows. Um, and there is um, a man, Isaac Haight, who is in Cedar City in the 1850s. Ecclesiastical positions and political positions are very intertwined. There is no separation right. of church and state in 1850s Utah. And so Isaac Haight, who is high up in the Utah militia, is also the stake president in Cedar City. And he, saying he gets a bee in his bonnet, does that work for Brits? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. We know he, that one. Like, that's a, that's that works for British, <laughs> um, right? In a British context. Um, but that, that sounds a little trivial. But he is hell-bent on making these immigrants pay for whatever they've done. Um, and this goes up in front of a council actually two separate times and both times the council shuts it down. Um, the first council says, oh, did anything happen? Oh, sorry, I pressed a button accidentally. <laughs> um, the first time uh, it goes before a council. The council says, no, we're not doing anything. At a minimum, we will send a writer to Brigham Young to ask him what he thinks. Um, and so they they do that. The second time it goes before a council, the council also shuts it down. But Isaac Haight circumvents the council that are in place. And these function kind of like high councils, kind of like city councils. It's, it's very much a theocracy in 1850s Utah. Um, but the councils do what they should do, why they're in place, and they shut yeah. it down. But he is determined that something happens. He recruits John D. Lee, um, and John D. Lee is his has a federal position as a farmer to the native peoples, to the indigenous peoples, to help learn, help teach them agriculture. Since the the white Mormons have come and colonialized Utah and reduced their normal abilities to hunt and to fish, um, they are trying to teach them agriculture. And so John D. Lee actually has this place of, um, of confidence with the uh, native peoples and um, Isaac Haight has him recruit them to help um, first follow and track this immigrant train and then later helps them to, to attack. Um, so on September 11th, 1857, um, a U.S., a U.S., a Mormon uh, Latter-day Saint militia. Um, in my most recent book, I actually use Latter-day Saint when I'm talking about factual things, and I use Mormon when I'm talking about perceptions to try mm. and distinguish between those. But this is a Latter-day Saint militia who have recruited um, indigenous peoples, the Paiutes, to help them and they attack this immigrant train and they slaughter this immigrant train. A hundred people were killed. Oh my goodness. Um, in, in my mind, this is clearly the darkest moment in Latter-day Saint history. And this is not one, I think by understanding the context, we can understand how it happened, but certainly nothing excuses that it did happen. It never, it never should have happened, and there is no excuse for for it happening. Um, I started working on Mountain Meadows a long time ago. Um, I was finishing up a master's degree in history at BYU, and I had changed my thesis topic kind of late in the process, and so I took a little bit longer than normal, and I had some months in before I was headed off to, I went to divinity school next, 
Um, and I, um, so I, I needed a job and I interviewed for a job as a research assistant um, with Ron Walker, who was a really beloved history professor at BYU. And he said, um, we're working on Brigham Young and the Indians. And I was not particularly interested in Brigham Young and the Indians, <laughs> um, but I needed a job. <laughs> I had months where I needed to, to find something to do. And um, so I went in for what I thought was a second interview. And he said, no, we're actually working on the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And there were three historians from the church, um, Ron Walker and Glenn Leonard, who was the head of the Museum of Church um, History and Art, and um, Rick Turley, Richard Turley, who was the assistant, mm. was he assistant church historian at that point? He was probably managing director of the church's church history department at that time. And they thought they had these three authors and a whole host of people working on this project. And they thought that they could write uh, a good history of the Mountain Meadows Massacre in about um, six months. And that ended up taking about eight years. <laughs> but <laughs> I, um, that was my start on, on Mountain Meadows. And and it was it was really difficult. I mean, the first thing he had me do was, uh, well, actually, when he told me we were actually working on Mountain Meadows, he said, "Do you still want this job? <laughs> are you are you sure you want to do this?" And I naively said yes. <laughs> and but um, I initially it wasn't the project wasn't public, and so I couldn't talk about it, which was really hard. And yeah, as I first started working on it, I was just for weeks I was nauseated every day with accounts I was reading. And I was reading lots of newspaper articles and I didn't know how to, the reality is bad enough, but then you had all these sensational stories adding on to the reality. And it was very difficult for me to kind of unpack this. That's a, that's a very interesting angle from your book specifically is the, the adding of sensationalism from media, which we'll, we will touch on in a, in a bit, but I'm, I, I mean, these accounts that you were reading, what kind of accounts were these? Were they survivors? Were they witnesses to it? And did you have any, did you have any challenges as a researcher and scholar and editor of these accounts relying on them? You know, I, I can imagine that there was a lot of emotion from people writing these. There was probably a lot of guilt as well. I mean, I just wonder if these had impacted the reliability of these accounts at all. Oh, yeah, it definitely re affected the reliability. So I worked just for about six months on Mountain Meadows before I went off to Divinity School. Um, and then and you when did I, Divinity School at Vanderbilt, right? At Vanderbilt, yes. Um, so that must have been I was, amazing. It was fantastic. I, yeah, I, I got a master's in theology and wow. um, it was it was really a phenomenal time. But I came back and I wasn't quite ready to jump into a PhD program. And so again, I was looking for a job. <laughs> and um, Rick Turley at that point um, hired me to work on Mountain Meadows again. Um, they had decided that they needed to publish John D. Lee, who was ultimately executed for the, for the massacre, um, had two separate trials and they wanted to publish the, the minutes of those trials and all the testimony. And so that becomes the, the central source of, um, of information about Mountain Meadows are these, this trial testimony, which was all originally taken in Pittman shorthand. Um, and we have um, the church history department has this woman, Lejean um, Carruth, per, uh, Purcell Carruth, who has this miraculous brain that just fragments in a million different directions. She has a PhD in like German literature. Um, <laughs> but when she was 15, she taught herself Deseret, alf the Deseret alphabet. 
Um, wow. And then later taught herself Pittman shorthand. Now, Pittman shorthand survived for longer in England than it did in the U.S. England and Canada, people used it for a lot longer than it did in the U.S. But all of these court transcripts were in Pittman shorthand. And there were transcriptions, but as we learned, the transcriptions did not always match the shorthand. And so she made entirely new transcriptions and that became the major source. But what one of the things that we learned in working on this is that you can't always trust what someone says about themselves. You can trust more what they say about other things because they're not lying about everything. That, that's too hard. That's too many things to keep track of, right? But they're, they're mostly concerned with covering their own back and protecting themselves. And so by taking that into account and, and being extreme, I mean, you have to be extremely suspicious of any source. And as a historian, that's part of learning the methodology of, of um, you know, being able to judge sources and pull lots of sources together, never just rely on a single source. Um, but we learned that you can kind of, if you pull what they say about themselves out, you can kind of triangulate what probably happened or something very I close see. to to what happened. And so that became really critical in trying to put together this this narrative of what happened at at Mountain Meadows, because right. for a long time you had the only people really talking about it were people who wanted to to cover it up. Um, oh. And that, and because of all that tension in Utah, um, though Brigham Young seemed to want to know what happened, it took a long time for them to actually find out what what actually happened. Right, um, Janice, I, I'm I'm very confused listening to this about the about the decision making of Isaac Haight and and others involved, especially when I. When I hear the very distressing story of, and uh, I'm not as <laughs> clear on you, obviously, about details, uh, not in the slightest, but but when they they told the immigrants to um, to put their weapons aside and that they would look after them and and you know not worry about them, and then they ended up actually shooting all of them, um, which you know, as I say, it is it's just horrifying to think about. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, does the, does the wider political and social climate of the kind of American frontier, wild west kind of atmosphere, does, when you put it in the context of that and not judge it by present standards, is it more kind of indicative of the, the violent place that parts of America were at the time, or is it still particularly, particularly shocking in that time? Um, well, I, I would say that kind of that level of violence is shocking in any time. Yeah. Um, but within the context of now, within the context of America in the 19th century, um, America is a violent place. Now, historians, there is a pretty wide range of historiography on violence in the West whether it is kind of the shootout at OK Corral, if that is the standard or that is something exceptional. Um, however, I would actually say that U.S. Army, um, U white U.S. militias are kind of the best point of comparison and their interactions with Native peoples, because you have all sorts of times when it's called a battle, but it is really the U.S. Army that is wiping out Native peoples in really horrific ways. And when you look at numbers in terms of massacres in the 19th century, all of the ones that are comparable are, are usually white militias, white U.S. Army um, attacking Native peoples. Now, you have a couple examples of Native peoples fighting back um, very understandably. Um, you also, um, you have kind of um, some other things that, that would make it very comparable, but also you have in the 19th century, the U.S. Civil War, which um, is, I think, a, a big comparison here. Now, people, 
don't like that comparison because, oh, war, war is a different animal. But it tells us something about the kind of um, the acceptability of certain kinds of violence. Now, in the narrative that is going to be told about the Latter-day Saints, these are never points of comparison. They always talk about how Mountain Meadows is something exceptional. There's nothing in the U.S. that matches it. You have to go to the religious wars in Europe. You have to go to Huguenots being slaughtered. Um, you have to go to St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, or you have to go to the Orient to non-white people. Those are the only kind of people who would perpetuate such such violence. So wherein there are actually quite a few examples of kind of co comparative levels of violence that happen in the U.S., especially under this kind of military rubric. Um, but that's never uh, culturally or popularly where the narrative goes. The narrative always goes to this is the example of why we can't trust Mormons or why we need to rid ourselves of the Mormons because this is this is what Mormons do. It always goes in a very different direction. Right. Um, but but yeah, just and and the other the other element that I haven't mentioned here, um, the 1850s is known as the Reformation in Utah. There is this Brigham Young, particularly Brigham Young and Jedediah Grant, who is one of the apostles, um, are very concerned that the saints have gotten to Utah. They're they're lazy now. They're uh, they've they've lost their fire. They're not committed to the church, um, and so there is this reformation started to kind of try and um, rededicate people. They're rebaptizing people. They're trying to have people show, um, make explicit demonstrations of their um, of their dedication to the church. And in this, you have lots of violent rhetoric. Now, um, I, I would argue that in most instances, it's, it's rhetoric, but we do have, we, we have some, some instances where it does play out in, in violent ways. And Mountain Meadows is, I think, a primary one. Um, now, rhetoric is going to contribute to how people think about the violence. It's it's not going to it's not going to be a vacuum. It's not just going to be, oh, that's ju those are just words. Words matter. Um, and so that certainly contributes to, to what happens there, too. It's interesting, kind of that makes a lot of sense, given some aspects of today's climate. You know, um, we see recent very recently we've seen the shocking consequences of violent political rhetoric. Um, mm -hmm. being bubbled down and, you know, trickled down to cause people to actually act. And yeah, it's it's really interesting, that aspect of it. And, yeah. you know, we often, well, we, we know this and we say it as a, a stain on Latter-day Saint history. Uh, and I, I wonder, you know, how much do people put blame at the foot of the church at the time uh, and kind of was there any involvement from Brigham Young uh, and was there anything the church could have done more to prevent this given that they were um, stake presidents uh, <laughs> local leaders you know or or is this you know well yeah 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 um I think that I don't know. I mean, thinking about prevention is always a, a difficult thing. Um, mm. Southern Utah, particularly Cedar City, is so isolated. It is difficult for us in this information age to to recognize just how isolated they were. And right. those rumors and things that would come seem to be exacerbated with the lack of information, that there isn't that information to provide a corrective. So they get those rumors, but don't get the benefit and the kind of quelling power of more information always to, to calm things down. Um, so, so I think that that is, is a difficulty. I mean, I think that there are some pretty caustic personalities in Southern Utah at the time. Um, this is maybe a little too, uh, but I kind of think that sometimes Brigham Young sent difficult people away. <laughs> 
<laughs> to, to figure things out. But also some of those people really needed, like you needed to be able to develop this desert, you know, and to make these settlements in this, in this very sparse, empty place and to, you know, start agriculture and to start getting food and from the land like that takes really strong, hardworking people, but sometimes they're also a little caustic. And so we have some some personalities that are definitely at play here. Um, and I mean, Isaac Hate is the one that I actually hold most responsible. It would not have happened without him. Um, John D. Lee is certainly responsible, but also it wasn't his idea. Um, even though he was the one who uh, who federally uh, legally paid the price for it, um, but it's um, yeah, the lack of information is is really is very difficult. The kind of using this fiery rhetoric and this violent rhetoric. If you didn't expect someone to take it and as a, a reflection of reality, you probably should have thought about that some more. Um, and that's and that's always going to be a, a difficult thing. It's easy to get swept up in, uh, you know, in kind of oh, people are reacting to this this kind of fiery rhetoric, but also you may lose you may lose that. And you may lose control over how people take that rhetoric and what what they do with that with that rhetoric. Um, and and those are uh, those are certainly things that that should have been done. I'm the fact that. I mean, for me, one of the big things that I learned here is how important our councils are. Like yeah, yeah. council tried to shut this down. Now it didn't, it wasn't able to stop it, but every time had Isaac Haight been as committed to following the kind of proper order of how things are supposed to function, it would have been shut down. It would have stopped there. It wouldn't have continued. And, and so I, I believe that councils are places where it's not just to, you know, for everyone to speak their piece and then the bishop to still do whatever they want to do. You know, councils are a place that can bring revelation and we can come and maybe we at leave with a very different idea than we came with. But if we're not open to that, then, then we're never going to get that benefit. Isaac Haight didn't want that benefit. He still wanted, he was still hell bent on doing what he wanted to do. And he, he did that. Um, and he followed through with it and got other people to sign on to to approve um, what he what he was doing. That's a that's a really fascinating point to take away from it. There is there is safety in council. Um, yeah, is that what Elder Ballard used to say, or uh, one of them? Um, yeah, yeah, and, and definitely. Was it, am I right in saying that Brigham Young did send a letter saying not? to do this? That yes. Had... So that, so I talked about the first time the council meets, yes. they decide to, because hate keeps pushing it. They say, okay, well, we'll send a letter to, to Brigham Young. They actually oh. have a writer. His name is James Haslam. He rides for three days straight. Um, I, I'm sorry, 36 hours straight. So not quite three days to get to Salt Lake. Like he has a, a letter that to go to bishops in different um, cities and towns along the way to swap out horses so he can ride straight to Salt Lake. He wow. gets there, Brigham Young writes a letter, lets him, he's, he like lays down for two hours and then he rides back. Um, but by the time he comes back, the massacre has already happened. He comes back on, um, it happened the day before, by the time. Again, very back. confusing decision-making very con yeah. obviously uh, very confusing oh yeah and um yeah and and that um when when john e lee is first tried it's it's really interesting and this is a major piece of of my um most recent book yes. but that 
the, their goal is not really to convict John D. Lee. They don't seem particularly interested in that. They're more interested in pinning it on the church as a whole. And as the trial moves through, specifically Brigham Young. Um, and and I argue that that is one of the, the trial ends in a hung jury. Um, they are very definitely trying to say, um, this is because of who Mormons are. This is the example of who Mormons are. Um, that that they are um, either like the like the Indians, and when I say Indian, I mean like this, you know, perception of this caricature of of native peoples, um, or they are even more savage. They're hyper savage, um, or they are. You know, they're they're not the right kind of manly. They're um, they're either, you know, they're making women do the work <laughs> or they're too too manly, too hyper manly because they're committing this kind of violence. But all of this comes together in this narrative that um, Mormons don't belong in the United States. Um, questions about and there's going to be questions about uh, their whiteness. And American was definitely um, considered synonymous with whiteness during this period. Um, so there are questions about, well, white people don't act that way. White civilization doesn't act that way. So the Mormons must not be white. Um, but there are um, lots of ways that this narrative is used. But one of the most enduring successes, I think, of, the, of that first trial is pinning it on Brigham Young. Um, right. This narrative um, comes really as a result of sensational newspaper reports um, that argues that Brigham Young actually ordered the massacre. Um, and and that is a narrative that endures till today. Um, we we still get that that narrative, um, even though I think it's been very conclusively historically disproven. It's not. It's not even a possibility, um, but however, the the perception has remained. Can you give some examples of the sensationalism? I'm really interested to hear more about that and and like how how those sensationalist things have have gone on to kind of well continue to to impact the cultural perception of Latter Day Saints, you know, from them. Yeah. So just as it, it's it's very interesting because you have kind of this these stories of of mountain meadows that are told in popular culture mostly in newspaper magazines but also they they expand into novels um, the latter part of the 19th century we start to get lots of novels the early 20th century lots of novels that will include mountain meadows um, and they they follow certain trends as these ideas about Mormon savagery, about gender ideals, and manhood is always slippery. Anyone who's going to say, you know, depending on your time period, and if you're in 17th century France, how you're defining what a man is, is very different than 19th century America or 21st century America. Um, and, and those kind of gender ideals are always slippery. And for a minority group, it is always difficult, even if you do things that seem to fit in the categories that the culture has constructed, very often you are excluded from that culture. Um, but they're gonna find another reason to, to exclude you because they don't, because these are never, um, solid, steadfast categories. They always move and change and are often about excluding people on the margins. And Latter-day Saints are very definitely on the margins in the 19th century. Um, they are the Mormon problem. <laughs> they are not the Mormon people. <laughs> they are the Mormon problem. And um, and so you have these uh, these narratives newspapers and they will take sometimes something will come up um so like the idea that brigham young got a revelation to order that the massacre should happen 
That actually first comes up in an anti-polygamy novel called The Mormon Prophet and His Harem, um, which is published in 1872 um, by Catherine Van Valkenburg. Her husband is a federal judge who's been appointed in Utah. And she writes this anti-polygamy novel, one of the um, one of the biggest anti-polygamy novels. Um, there are a whole slew of them that will have great commercial success in the 19th century. And she suggests that Brigham Young got a revelation and she like lays out this narrative of how this led to Mountain Meadows. That is actually something that is brought up in John D. Lee's first trial, accusing Brigham Young of getting a revelation. It came from, it's, it's fiction. It came from this anti-polygamy novel, yet right. it comes up. And so there's this very interdependent relationship between what happens in the legal procedures and what's happening as they're legally trying to prosecute Mountain Meadows and what's happening in popular culture. And they're very definitely, someone will testify, the newspapers will carry um, their witness, the, the witness testimony, and then elements of that will start being worked into these popular narratives. And, um, and you know, this is what, when I first started working on Mount Meadows, this is what I was reading was these kind of highly fictionalized narratives. And I didn't know, I mean, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know what to do with all of this. Mm -hmm. Today, I can spar I can parse it out and say, okay, this comes from here and this comes from here. And this is when this element was introduced. And I can see how that comes together. But but that's after spending most of my career on Mountain Meadows. Like, that's not something that comes in an instant. So, so based on that, how did the both the wider church and the wider nation react to the massacre? I, I mean, I, I've heard, um, I watched that uh, TV show, Godless, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great show. Um, but it, they referenced that in there. And I was, you know, I was wondering um, if that was yeah. actually accurate. But also the fact that a, a couple of weeks ago, we did an episode on the William Martin handcart companies. Mm -hmm. And they would have arrived a year before this. And I just yeah. think of those saints from England who had just come over the ship. Uh, and they come and then this is one of the kind of first things they have to kind of deal with as being a, a, a member of the church in Zion. Um, yeah. Fascinating. And for the most part, the Latter-day Saints want to just ignore that it happened. Right. Um, Brigham Young, his personality, he doesn't like talking about hard things. He does not, he, and Mountain Meadows isn't the only thing. He doesn't want to talk about Missouri. He never wants to talk right. about Missouri. Like the Missouri period was so difficult for him. He will just tell people to stop talking about it because he doesn't like talking about, about difficult things. And there is still so much attention on the Latter-day Saints. And there is so much, the army is, has just settled on Utah. They are there. It is very tense. The Saints never, you know, fully took off and left but it is still very, it, things are, are very tense and, um, and they don't want anything else that's gonna cause them more trouble with the federal government. So I think for the most part, he's just trying, he was told, John D. Lee reported to him a couple weeks after the massacre and said that it was an Indian massacre. And I think he, wa he wants to believe that. He, um, from Wilford Woodruff's account, he weeps when he hears that, and he says, he actually very, I think prophetically says, we're gonna get blamed for this. And we did get blamed for it, but we were also responsible for it. And at that point he didn't know. And I think that because of his personnel, his not wanting to know about difficult things, I think that it takes him a long time to fully understand just how involved the Latter-day Saint militia was. And I don't think he understands it completely until 1871. And that's when he excommunicates John D. Lee and Isaac Haight. Um, right. But I think it takes him a long time to, to really know. Um, that doesn't mean he couldn't have known earlier. 
Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't want one more thing that could cause the church problems with the federal government. And so he tries to push it away. Um, participants in the massacre, a couple write him letters um, and he says, stay away, just go away, don't come back. Um, he, just, he just wants it out. Um, and it's not actually until John D. Lee's second trial when he says, you know, we actually should support this, this prosecution because it is important that the perpetrators here are found guilty. Interesting. Uh, now, with the, I mean, you've written so much and you were the general editor of the, as you mentioned before, the, the legal kind of documents with it. Can you just teach me more about that and why why the key figures in this weren't really brought to justice even? That's kind of a confusing part of it. Well, they they ran. <laughs> right. So they, so when Brigham had told them to go, they really did go. Well, and, and he I don't we don't have any evidence that he actually initially said, get out of here. Though right. later on we have at least one letter from um uh, from William Stewart and, and Brigham says, I don't want to hear anything from you. Stay away. Um, but so concurrent with the Mount Meadows prosecutions are polygamy prosecutions. And so oh, right. yeah. there, so this is another diff, uh, just a consistent difficulty about Mount Meadows is this is never the only thing that's going on. So the federal government is trying to prosecute anyone who is participating in polygamy, um, which is most of most of these people, um, but not not all of them. Um, and but when they know that there are warrants out for them, so the indictment was drawn in um, 1874. So Philip uh, Klingen Smith, who was the bishop in Cedar City had actually left the church by 1874 and um, a friend of his encouraged him to write an affidavit about Mountain Meadows. Um, he wrote that affidavit, it was published and it directly led to indictments, including his own indictment. Um, so nine people were indicted in 1874 and very, they had arrest warrants for them all very quickly. Um, William Dame, who was uh, another stake president, but he was above um, Isaac Haight in the militia. Um, he was the only one who didn't go on the run. Um, he was arrested very quickly. Um, and he would have been brought to trial very quickly, but his, he, basically got off on a technicality because his indictment did not specify where Mountain Meadows was. And um, it did not say Utah Territory. And um, his attorneys got him off. Um, oh. John D. Lee was on the run, but he was arrested. Actually, he was hiding in a chicken coop when he was arrested. Um, and there are a number of very vibrant stories told about his arrest with his wife, Rachel, coming out with a shotgun. And um, it's, it's really interesting the way the different narratives, like they're very focused on kind of gender ideals. We have this woman who's acting in a very manly sort of way, coming out with a shotgun. And then her husband, who is hiding, who is not taking it like a man, you know, he's hiding in a chicken coop. Um, when he is arrested. Now, there are a number of different stories about how, how that happened, but it was the moment that got a lot of attention um, because I think it reinforced some of these different ideas um, about the Mormons and about why the Mormons didn't fit in America. Um, but the others, Isaac Haight, John Higby, who is the sheriff in Cedar City, um, but he is the one who actually gave the order on the massacre field. So I, I didn't mention before, but Isaac Haight and William Dame were not actually on the massacre field the day of the massacre. They, oh. 
it wouldn't have happened without Isaac Haight, and he did not see the car. He did not see the carnage until it was already done. He oh, interesting. He went to the massacre field the day after, and um, which was the same time that he got right after that he got the letter from Brigham Young and um said he said in, in, that he he sobbed um I I don't have a lot of pity on him but. Um, but he was on the run for the rest of his life. He actually died in Arizona. Um, and he was staying with his nephew and his nephew's wife. And they actually buried him in the basement of the house because they were worried about burying him somewhere public, um, when he was originally buried. And I think there's a family group that just recently moved the body to, back to Utah, to Southern Utah, but that's an, another thing. But um, most of these men uh, were on the run for the rest of their lives. Um, John M. Higby, uh, just Utah becomes a state in 1890. And just after that, um, these indictments are finally dropped. They're, they just kind of hang there for a very long time. Um, most of the people who were indicted were um, major participants, but there were a couple that were just kind of people who were on the massacre field. There were about 50 um, Latter-day Saint men who participated. And a couple of those were just your average militia members. And so it was kind of puzzling that they were included in the indictment and nothing, they just kind of had to live in limbo for a really long time. Um, both the two, Ellet Wilden and George Adair, were both arrested and jailed for months at a time, but never actually brought to trial. Um, there was another man who was actually a judge in Southern Utah, but was not involved in the massacre at all. He wasn't there. He wasn't involved in any of it. He lived further away, but there, I think that he was included just to try and indict him because he was a judge and had this kind of respected position. Um, he and his wife took in one of the um, the immigrant children um, who was orphaned and, and left after the massacre, which I get I haven't I haven't mentioned, but there were 17 children who um, who survived the massacre um, and were all brought to. Rachel Hamblin's home the night of the massacre after just seeing their parents and families slaughtered. It's horrific. It really is. Uh, with the with the trials, then it's it seems like you said before that it was a, a hung jury, uh, and it almost seems like the that was enough for for them. The, the almost the goal and the agenda was not to actually get decent justice for the horrific things that occurred but just get enough so that the president of america and and the media could finally see the the proposed threat of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and, and to cast aspersions on the organization rather than actually sort the actual issue that happened at would that be right yeah we and we actually have um both um, one of the the main prosecutors, one of the U.S. attorneys, he's an assistant U.S. attorney who was leading up the polygamy prosecutions, but was added on to this case at the last minute. He actually says later, years later, that that a hung jury was actually the best scenario for them. Um, we also have a, a Salt Lake Tribune um, reporter who writes a letter to his wife just before the the verdict comes or the lack of verdict comes. And he says, he writes to his wife and he says, it's really odd that we really don't want a guilty verdict. That's, that's not best served. And I think that in that space was because there wasn't a, a conviction, then the stories just blossomed and just spun uh. out of, out of control that there was no, 
I mean, in the 19th century, there are very few limits on kind of sensational journalism. That is that is something that is happening across the board. Um, but the lack of a conviction actually propelled the narrative further. And in the, in the two years, so John D. Lee's first trial is in 1875, um, in July of 1875. The second trial is in 1876, and he's actually convicted. The church helps at that point and kind of real helps make sure that the witnesses show up and testify and um, and there's a new uh, there is a new U.S. attorney who is not focused on convicting the church, just wants to convict the actual perpetrators of the crime. And um, but Brigham Young dies the next year in 1877. And in that two year space from Johnny Lee's first trial to 1877, the narrative of Mountain Meadows completely changes. And Brigham Young now ordered the massacre. And, and that narrative is going to endure for a century, more than a century. It's going to wow. endure, you know, for 150 years to today. Um, you're going to have things like Under the Banner of Heaven, which is still going to argue that, that Brigham Young ordered that and add new, you Does know, it? new conspiracies that Brigham Young also ordered the death of, of um, Joseph Smith. But, but it is going to, it's going to take up, and you mentioned Godless before. Godless is not, it is very accurate in depicting a 19th century novel about the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Oh, I see. Does that make sense? <laughs> so it's de it's definitely a fictionalized, but for those who haven't seen Godless, the, um, the antagonist in the story, the central baddie in the story, is one of those orphan children that the Mormons killed his parents, and then he is raised by Isaac Haight, which isn't true. The Haights didn't take in any orphans from the massacre, but his father teaches him this religion that his religion is basically to kill. That this is, that Mountain Meadows becomes emblematic of who Mormons are rather than this horrific exception to, to who Mormons are. I didn't realize it was mentioned in Under the Banner of Heaven. I, I haven't watched yeah. it, but um... the last the last episode very clearly gets to Mountain Meadows. Actually, my mm -hmm. um, convicting the Mormons book, my manuscript was due the same day the last episode of Under the Banner of Heaven was dropping, <laughs> and I had tried. I had talked to producers. I tried to get a copy earlier, but because I wasn't, it wasn't like an immediate piece that would bring attention you know, immediately, they didn't want to give me permission to see it early. So I had to ask my publisher if I could have one more day. So I finished watching the episode as soon as it dropped, it dropped at like 10 p.m. And at 2 a.m. I turned in my manuscript. No uh, way. Because I had to, <laughs> to write something about this, this last piece. But the whole, the basic thesis of, so Under the Banner of Heaven looks at two horrific murders that happened in Utah in the 1980s, mm -hmm. and but tries to, to make these ties back to um, Mormon history, to Latter-day Saint history. And, and the basic thesis is that Mormonism produces violent men. I mean, that, that is the the kind of the basic thesis of of the show is that this again just like those 19th century you know sensational novels that this is what this is a product of mormonism rather than you know something exceptional and and something that is horrific and not accepted this is just what mormon mormonism does very strange very, very strange. Um, tying in with, but also with, very um, slick, and you know, we we kind unfortunately. of unfortunately, yeah, like godless. They never use the word Mormon, but you know, you it they do name Mountain Meadows, and mm. I was just watching Godless. I mean, it's marketed as like a feminist western. You know, yeah. I was watching it for Lady Mary. Um, I you know I and. 
was was very surprised when Godless, um, when uh, Mount Meadows suddenly showed up. So was I. I remember watching it. I my wife loves westerns, so we, uh-huh. we quite often watch west, westerns, and we kind of looked at each other when it was mentioned, be like, "What? Yeah, <laughs> that's random." Um, yeah, but kind of going forward to beyond um, that period of time and and linking in with an interesting point you made earlier about Wilford Woodruff. Uh, did the did the church's willingness to um, engage in discussion about this uh, evolve over time? And have any modern leaders uh, addressed that issue at all? So um, Charles Penrose, who was an apostle um, in, during this period, well, I don't know when he becomes an apostle, but in the, I think it's in the 1880s, he writes a pamphlet on Mountain Meadows, trying mm-hmm. to kind of lay out, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. And um, he's not completely wrong. He's got some things that are that are wrong, but there is a certain level of trying to be kind of honest about it, trying to be uh, transparent about it. Um, but for the most part, the church has not wanted to talk about it. Um, in the 18, in the 1950s, Juanita Brooks, who was a school teacher in Southern Utah, um, and her actually a man, um, I I believe he was just in her neighborhood in her ward, um, who was one of the massacre participants. And he asked her to come to his home. He wanted to leave a history with her and she didn't go. And she only saw him just before he died. And he died and says something some with some kind of vision of blood. Like it's it's pretty dramatic. Um, but it it compels her to start studying Mount Meadows. And she publishes the first um I wouldn't say the first real history. There is a pretty good one that's done in the 1930s. Um but the first really complete history of Mount Meadows in the 1950s. Um, the church is not really happy about it. The church is kind of uh, happy that their people think we're American now and don't want to bring up things that um, maybe might change people's ideas um, at that time. And But it's not really until... Um, 2008. I, I mean, this this is the book that I first started working on Mountain Meadows on. But in 2008, um, Massacre at Mountain Meadows is published by those three historians, Rick Turley, Ron Walker, and Glenn Leonard. Um, it's published by Oxford. Um, but it is, I mean, uh, Will Bagley, who wrote another Mountain Meadows book, which was called Blood of the Prophets. Just the title tells tells us a little bit about his angle um, on it. He was he was sure that Brigham Young ordered the massacre and believed he had a smoking gun that illustrated that, which was um, convincingly eradicated by massacre at Mountain Meadows. Um, right. But um, that he used to say that massacre at Mountain Meadows was the most expensive book ever produced. Um, and he was saying it derog- in, in, as, in a derogatory manner um, right. and also kind of out of annoyance because no single historian would have the kind of resources that they had that went to Massacre at Mountain Meadows. And I was one of just many, a whole department, a whole church history department where a whole section of the department was just working on Mount Meadows. And you had people going all over the country, finding whatever they could. And so I, and I understand I'm a historian, like that's a frustrating thing when, when you want more resources, when you know you could do more with more resources. But I think that that tells us that has been a really significant shift for the church as a whole. And it tells us something about our current commitment to be able to talk about hard things and to be able to to look at our past with much more transparency. That doesn't mean that we still don't have things that we can do better, um, but 
but I think that the really the commitment that that was that book massacre at Mountain Meadows. And for me, I mean, and I think the biggest problem with the book is that the authors are, you know, that they were funded by the church. There are some people who are going to discount it for that reason alone, but they're not going to discount it for the research because the research is solid and it is just, it is so extensive. It is far more extensive than any, you know, even three historians on their own could produce. Um, it is it is something really remarkable what has been focused on really bringing transparency to this dark moment, bringing some light. And I still believe that sunshine is the best disinfectant, bringing light. Even we can't, when I was early on, when I was working on this, I would have people once, once I could actually talk about it, <laughs> but I would have people say, oh, you're going to tell us like why this wasn't as bad, <laughs> you know? Oh, and I'm like, yeah. no. I'm not. <laughs> this doesn't get better. Like we can understand how this could happen, but we cannot explain this away. This was horrific and this never should have happened by believing Latter-day Saints, most of all. Yet there is power in being able to look at something so horrific with light and to shine a light on there and to learn something from it. And that has, has really, I think, shaped my whole methodology as a historian. It's, it's shaped me as a person. Um, early on in the project, Rick Turley, who became the assistant church historian sometime in this, in this process, I'm, I'm not great with, I'd have to map it all out, the timeline. But he said to me when before he started, and really he was the he was the person that drove this. He was the person who got the initial approval um, by the brethren to to do this project. Um, and he said, you know, I I realized that I couldn't do this if I was fearful that Brigham Young had ordered the massacre. He said, I had to realize that even if Brigham Young ordered the massacre, the church was still true. Mm. And he said, only when I realized that could I actually approach this with full transparency. Be well, know that I am really figuring, I'm not just coming to the conclusion I want to come to, but that I am actually trying to know what happened. There's some pieces of this we're just not going to know, but um, we know so much more because we've been willing to ask hard questions and we've been willing to support more transparency and better being able to deal with with those those difficult things. And the Joseph Smith Papers comes out in. After that, like this, all of this is is part of that effort by the church to to be okay with difficult difficult things, and not just hide them under the rug or sweep them away. So, was that an important philosophy for you when initially being challenged by all these accounts, and as you said, feeling nauseous when reading them because of how horrifying they were, and yet you kept your faith despite that was that did that trickle down um for you as well yeah i mean it was it was i don't i i was very naive when i went into it when i started i just i had no idea what i was getting myself into this is not something i ever would have chosen i did my master's thesis was on latter-day saint women's religious experience like this is this is not something i would have chosen but it, you know, I needed a job at the time. And so I just kind of ignored the rest of the stuff. But, um, and I felt like it was really important. And that drove me to, and it was actually interesting because, you know, I just worked on it for a few months and then I went away to graduate school again. And um, I was, I still had, anyway, I, 
he had initially said it was just going to be for four or five months. And I was still going to have a summer before the fall when school would start again. And so I had lined up another job. And but we were clearly not done after four or five months. And I said, you know, I have I don't want to bail on these people, but I would like to try and do these two things at the same time. Um, and he said, look, I'm going to have to replace you when you go in the fall. So rather than you doing two things, not very well, <laughs> why don't you just focus on one thing and do it, you know, really well. And I was really angry with him because I didn't feel like I was done with Mountain Meadows. And, you know, I had no idea that I would finish up, I would be at Divinity School for a couple of years, and I would come back and work on this for the next couple decades. You know, I I had no idea it was going to, well, it's too, yeah, I guess altogether a couple decades, but uh, I had no idea that, that this would be, you know, a significant part of my career. Um, I'm glad that it's not my career forever because it's really nice to work on projects that aren't Mountain Meadows anymore. <laughs> I don't think I will be doing any more Mountain Meadows books, but um, but it has been important in in shaping me and my testimony and knowing that the church can stand up to hard questions. I think that sometimes there are some who would have us believe that if we ask hard questions, there isn't space to believe anymore. That any, any intelligent person, if they are actually are willing to ask hard questions, that there will no longer be a reason to believe. And that is, could not be more opposite than my experience. Even as I see people doing horrific things and things that should not have happened, that does not affect um, my, I, I shouldn't say it doesn't affect, it does affect because my testimony has to change. And I can't just have kind of a simple black and white testimony anymore because people are messy and history is messy. And having a faith that can withstand that is really important. But I think that when we are willing to sometimes wrestle with really hard questions that we come out stronger. Mm. Um, and not everybody's ready to wrestle. We can't impose a wrestle on anybody else. But when we are willing to sometimes ask hard questions and the church in that time since Massacre at Mountain Meadows has come out, the gospel topics essays have come out. The Joseph Smith papers have come out. There are so many more resources now for us to be able to to talk about hard things and to to find out more when we, when we're ready and when we're willing. And um, but it's it's on us. We have to decide if we're if we're ready. But I think that a faith that has been wrestled with is going to be so much stronger in the long run. It's going to give us the strength that we need to endure hard things. That's beautiful. And I, I think authentic as well. You know, it, your faith is authentic because you know you're here for the right reasons because some of the other reasons have, um, as you say, have been wrestled with. I, I think there's so much to learn from that. It's really inspiring. I, I didn't think when we were talking about Mountain Meadows Massacre that I would take away a point like that. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate what you've done in bringing these things to light and the research and the writing you've done. A link to your book will be in the description. Um, incredibly valuable. I hope people will look at it. And uh, well, Janice, where can people keep up to date with with things that you're working on? Um, so um, one of my post Mount Meadows projects. Um, I have a book coming out this fall. Um, I right now I am an acquisitions director for Deseret Book. Um, yes, I've yeah. just been at Deseret Book for the last year, so this is still relatively new to me. But before that, I was at the Maxwell Institute at BYU, and um, some of you may or may be familiar with. If you're not, I would encourage you to check them out. But the Maxwell Institute published 
a series of brief theological introductions to the Book of Mormon. So there are little books, they're about 100 pages on each book in the Book of Mormon. Oh. Um, and they are doing a series for the Doctrine and Covenants. They're called Themes in the Doctrine and Covenants, and I have written one of them. Um, they will be out this fall. And mine is on Revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants. And so I'm, um, I'm, I'll be very happy to, to see that. Um, I'm also working on a, a new book on early Book of Mormon reception. So trying to better understand how the earliest saints uh, both gained testimonies of the Book of Mormon, but also practically used the Book of Mormon and developed a relationship with the Book of Mormon. And so that's my larger ongoing project that um, now I'm trying to find bits and pieces of time to to get it done. So <laughs> well, hopefully look we'll see that pretty things. soon. Yeah, they both sound great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Janice. No problem. Thanks for having me, Ben. Thanks for watching For All The Saints. This show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts, subscribe to the channel, and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.